I'm Delian Totten and you're watching Natural Medicine World. We are bringing you a story of hope. We're filming in Newlands, Cape Town, South Africa, but the story started as a tragedy in Johannesburg, a miracle in Germany, and we hope that this miracle can be scientifically underpinned to help people in India and all around the world. And the story starts with Karen Smith. So Karen, you are an absolute living proof that miracles do happen. Please tell us your story. Okay. I'm a clinical uh, environmental and metal toxicologist and um, am qualified as a doctor in ethnotherapy. It's fortuitous that this has been my career path because I was diagnosed with cancer in 2007. I elected bilateral um, um, mastectomies because I felt that there was such a strong family history in mm. my my broader family of uh, cancers, different kinds of cancers, that I didn't want to uh, play with mm. such a diagnosis. Strangely enough, surgery is not a solution for cancer. All it does is remove a lump mm. or a tumor. Uh, cancer is a metabolic disease. And so I was metabolically ill. And s subsequent to the surgery, I suffered the most excruciating headaches and migraines that continued for several years, to the point of being so debilitating that I was struggling to work. I elected to check for any connection to the two remaining mercury fillings that were in my mouth, as well as uh, other connections between uh, teeth and neurology. Is this now to, to treat your migraine, to find the cause of your of, migraine and the cause of your cancer? Well, primarily it was to find the cause of the headaches, the mm -hmm. severe headaches. I mean, I was hospitalized once for 28 days with status migrainosis. It was that severe. So anyway, I had um, several tests run. The surgery was done on my mouth, uh, which basically entailed removing mercury fillings, uh, cleaning out some root canals, and extracting the root canal teeth so that there was no non-vital tooth in living bone. And thirdly, to remove any particles of mercury that sat in my jawbone as a result of abscesses years gone by that were cleaned up in apicectomies. When I woke up after surgery, I was um, in excruciating pain. It led ultimately to my loss of bladder control and my inability to walk. And I landed up in a wheelchair, about a week post-surgery, um, the most frightening period of my life. Again, fortuitously, about two months before that, I was at a conference uh, in, in London, uh, in the United Kingdom, where I met uh, Dr. Patricia Kane, and she, tra uh, she uh, promotes the treatment of neurotoxic syndromes by means of lipid exchange therapy. After the conference, I was also introduced to uh, two doctors from Germany that had used this method for at least 15 years in their practice and published research on it. And so when I fell ill in January and I contacted a colleague in London, she said, you have to fly to Germany. So there I go off to Germany, land up at Munich Airport in a wheelchair, and they test me and find mercury sitting on my anti-tumor gene, P53, and a chemical, a very nasty chemical that's found in body care products was on my superoxide dismutase gene. And, um, a so this was, this was bound to get, make your cancer it come back? It was bound to make my can cancer come back, mm. prematurely age me and kill me before m my time on life should have been spent, right. in life should have been spent. So ultimately, uh, they started a treatment of lipid transfer therapy on me in Germany. Please explain that in a nutshell. In a nutshell. Uh, it means that you follow a nutrient-dense diet, so you eat lots of protein uh, because of the sulfur content, lots of lipids uh, in the forms of fats and oils, and that you also receive uh, intravenous uh, infusions of phosphatidylcholine, uh, pushes of glutathione, which is an antioxidant, um, amino acid that actually cleanses toxins like chemical chlor, 
And thirdly, uh, they also give you sodium butyrate intravenously, which uh, has a twofold function. It deals with inflammatory states that have been created by the, the toxins in your body. Uh, and it also has the c capacity to um, burn off very long chain fatty acids, renegade fatty acids that we build up through exposure to eating the wrong foods, um, foods, oils that have been heated, mm -hmm. um, etc. So the good news was I started the therapy and within four days of being in Germany, I could actually get up out of a wheelchair what? and start walking for days. That is an absolute miracle. Yes. And what's wonderful is to know that it's a miracle, but lipids do what lipids do. Exactly. They can't not. Exactly. So it's scientific as well. Yes. And the, the, the body of, of research that underlies lipid transfer therapy is massive. Uh, lipids were used uh, f uh, as a transfer therapy in Eastern European countries for decades. Uh, it's only really become popular because of Patricia Kane's work in the United States in more recent years. And I, I, I read an article, a research article, um, just this week that said that in the last six years, even anaesthetists have found out that if you do boluses of, they call it lipid rescue, mm -hmm. uh, into a patient's veins with phosphatidylcholine, they can actually mitigate or undo the damage that really toxic pharmaceuticals or overdoses of right. toxins can do to people. And what about the um, toxic load as far as chemicals are concerned? Would this work for that as well? Well, I mean, look, lipids and toxins have a fatal attraction for one another. It's a love affair they can't avoid. So when lipids go in, not only do they uh, recover, heal and seal, mm -hmm. as it were, the cell membranes, but they have a further duty, and that is that they fuse with the toxic metals. They get exchanged out of the cells where glutathione can actually capture mm -hmm. them and mm -hmm. remove them via the bile to the feces and out of your mm -hmm. body. But we're again talking about metals. And, I mean, there seems to be a bigger problem globally, which is chemical. Uh, after two sets of lipid transfer therapies, I can... Uh, categorically show you that whatever was on my DNA was completely washed away. Uh, and that includes uh, chemicals uh, of the nature that you and I would encounter in our everyday lives. And so your, your, your gentlest way of removing toxins, and I'm using it in the plural sense of the word, from the body, would be via lipids. Mm -hmm. uh, historically, uh, chelation therapy has been used, which is a chemical process. It's quite harsh. Uh, chemical chelators are used that are mostly prescription drugs, whereas with lipids, you and I, the man in the street, could remove toxic metals if they just knew how to address their diet, how to avoid high-carbohydrate diets, because high-carbohydrate diets destabilize membranes, just by the way. So you're talking about potential epigenetic effects. Exactly, exactly. And, and so changing diet would be one thing. Correct. Finding, finding out what are the damaging foods to you as an individual. And there are certain foods that are more problematic than others, especially the ones that are morphine, peptides once they are half digested. So we're talking about grains, mm -hmm. we're talking about dairy products from cows, goats, sheep, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one dairy product that, that is exempt from that class and that's camel's milk. Okay. And the reason why I'm so excited about camel's milk is because camel's milk actually does not contain those casomorphines that prune neural circuits. Mm -hmm. And what camel's milk does exceptionally well that you don't get from the other milk is it raises your levels, listen to this, of intracellular, glu intracellular glutathione. It raises your levels of superoxide dismutase, which is an intracellular antioxidant mm -hmm. protecting your cells. Mm -hmm. And it raises your intracellular levels of myeloperoxidase within two weeks that of the time of starting to consume camel's milk as part of your daily, daily diet. Now, there are many other benefits to it, that it's antiviral and antibacterial and mm -hmm. antifungal, mm -hmm. which means that the good guys in your gut can produce those short-chain fatty acids that are neurologically anti-inflammatory and systemically anti-inflammatory, so your pain cascades come down. So camel's milk is a biggie for me. What, uh, what I just picked up on is the fact that dairy... Mm. prunes your neurons and that can, mean, just, and, can we and, just pause there for a minute yes and it's pro-inflammatory mm. i mean how many people do you know today that walk around with stuffed up sinuses but inflammation post? is the silent killer yeah yeah 
exactly. and it expresses itself in so many, many and a ways. precursor for cancer. I was just going to say exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then we have um, another miracle that that uh, it, I feel I have in my hands, and these are such powerful tools. And that is that I had the privilege of being trained as an auditory integration training practitioner, way back, way mm -hmm. back, and the old. Uh, otolaryngologist uh, in France, who has now passed away, Dr. Guy Birard, had a hardware system and I felt that we're moving into a digital age, so I worked with a programmer and we developed a software delivery system of exactly the same. The good news is that that software delivery system was tested, um, and it's the only system of its kind, was tested in, uh, the, um, uh, in Saudi Arabia at the King Saud Medical University in Riyadh, and the research that was m done on the system where they didn't just play this electronically modulated music to the kids and look for behavioral changes, they drew blood before they did the music, mm. they did blood after AIT, drew, drew bloods, and they did blood a That's month and aut three months. Auto-integration therapy. Auditory, Auditory integration, integration therapy. therapy. And what they found was that there is a thing called transforming growth factor beta-1 which is a remarkable molecule that is actually increased exponentially as you do auditory integration training. Mm -hmm. And if you look at that TGF beta 1, you'll see that it changes the way the brain works, it changes the way the brain, de the body detoxifies, it does miracles for the body in terms of cellular renewal. So oh, listening to electronically oh, modulated goodness. music can actually prevent cancers, can help your body detoxify, and can salvage brain, brains and neurons that are at risk. Oh. And they correlated this with, with the, the blood work with actual questionnaires where they, where they rated the children mm -hmm. uh, on autism scales. And they found out that in, within three months, the children were less autistic, mm -hmm. more communicative, more social, and more cognitively in tune, just because they had auditory integration training. But isn't this exactly what brought you to India? Yes, it is. I was invited in 2008 to go and train three of the uh, doctors of neuro, Indian neurotherapy in an uh, area called um, Faridkot in Punjab. I did their training as AIT practitioners, but while I was there, I was also asked to consult, and I was shocked at what I saw. Uh, I've never seen so many children that are neurologically damaged, with cerebral palsy, with convulsions, with autism, uh, physical deformities. And my first take on, on it was, as a toxicologist, these kids have been poisoned. Mm. So I took it on me to contact a laboratory in Germany, uh, I asked them if they would sponsor the tests for these kids because these families were in abject poverty. Many of them could not afford the testing. In fact, I, think, I don't think any of them could have afforded the tests. We did the testing and uh, it, the results were released in 2009 that upward of 88% 80, 80, of the children that we tested um, had uranium levels degrees above what would have been a approved by the World Health Organization. Intake through water? Mainly groundwater in the region. Mm. Uh, if you think of what the World, the World Health Organization would approve in terms of uranium particles in water, probably be about 5 to 15 parts per million. And we are talking here about, in some pockets in, in Punjab, where it exceeds 600 parts per million. So sure. it's, it's frightening that these kids were already affected in utero, mm. that pregnant mothers were, were poisoned. Um, I don't know if you know this, but there is a region just between India and Pakistan uh, on the northwestern border, which is called the Malva Belt, where they grow cotton. Mm. And in that Malva Belt, it's called the, the cancer, cancer train. The cancer train that goes from, from Malva to Delhi every week. There's, There's so, so many people, many people affected by cancer. And because of what happened to you, were you able to introduce the lipid transfer therapy to India? Sadly, not yet. That right. would be one of the goals of going back because uh, it was a long and hard, uh, I would say, call it an arduous battle to convince government that there was even something wrong with the water. Mm. Ultimately, the Supreme Court in India ruled that uh, they had to institute or install about a thousand reverse osmosis systems in the villages of North India. So it was a partial remedy. It still doesn't deal with the irrigation 
from the canals that get pumped onto mm -hmm. the fields. And you know, Punjab is the breadbasket of India. Mm. It's a, it's a, it's a, a amazing, uh, a fertile area where most of the food for the whole of India is grown. Mm. And so um, it was that struggle initially. And now years later, uh, you still have children affected, you still have families affected. So my hope is to go back and to bring some real answers to parents who have children that are afflicted in this way. So Karen, what can we do to help you in your support with the Indian community in Punjab? Well, look, the need always remains financial. Uh, I am a great believer in not throwing money down a bottomless pit. Africa has often been described as one of those pits where people from the West has just poured money into and it's gone nowhere. But I think we're starting to see changes in that. Uh, I have a wonderful story of hope, which I hope we could feature um, in Tanzania, which is just that, where self-help has led to a centre called Step by Step, where children uh, of the kind that are in India are now supported in their own school, in their own centre, with accommodation, with farming projects, fisheries, um, animal husbandry projects for the children, um, and educational interventions that would never have been possible before. The West made it possible because the structures were supplied, the physical buildings, mm -hmm. and the hostels were built that the local parents couldn't pay for. But there are people, local people, that have taken this and run with it. In India, they need a, uh, let's call it, for lack of another word, an apartment block. Because if people fly in from Canada or from Europe or from Australia to have their children treated by this amazing center that Dr. Brett Pulsing has put together with a group of neurotherapists, they would need accommodation for these parents and their children. And unfortunately, therapy is not a short-term thing. Mm -hmm. So if a parent flies in, they're there for weeks, sometimes months. And to come from where you've been and you've been living into a place where there are hardly any facilities just cuts the project's throat. Mm. People can't survive. Mm. And they then fly back, they go home, um, they extract the funds that they would have brought into the region, and the self-supportiveness of the, of, the, of the project suffers. Dr. Pritpal's work can be exported anywhere in the world through trained therapists providing that we can initially set up some kind of a college or funding, so accommodation, a college for, with funding, and obviously he's also needing expertise. He's, one of the reasons why he's asked me to come back to India is so that expertise can come into the project, train more therapists, and that parents would know that there's supervision of the work that's been done by people that are experts in their different fields. But very few Westerners would fly to India on their own bill because people have to work and make a living. Yeah. So they've, they've asked for fundraising for airfares and accommodation and uh, to enable to, to bring the therapist out to do the work. So, so those are our needs. And maybe we can do a series of episodes to, to support your work and to get it out there so people are aware of what's happening in India and other places around the world where there is heavy metal poisoning of the water system. I mean, there are very... Uh, affluent Punjabis that are living in other countries of the world. Some of them are TV network owners. And if one of those would just sponsor a series about how the work that I do, the work that Dr. Pritpal is doing, can actually benefit parents with children in those countries who are Punjabi speaking, it would make a massive difference. And to bring that kind of information, I mean, obviously it would be dubbed over from English to Punjabi, but can you imagine if those parents could hear this? Um, I don't know if you know this, but the Hindustan Times is one of the largest newspapers in the world because it has, there's just that many people living wow. outside of India that can then firsthand get this information and give, get access to it, either travel back to India for help or therapists can travel to them and help their children where they live outside of India. Thank you, Karen. And come on, guys, let's get this woman some support. Let's get the heavy metals out of the water in Punjab and other areas in the world and support these children with neurodevelopmental uh, challenges and get the metals and the poisons, the chemicals out of their bodies and Absolutely. give them a good fighting chance in Absolutely. life. Absolutely. Thanks, Karen. Thank you so much. It was really wonderful being here. Thank you. Thank you.